Welcome to the Advocata Deep Dive on the role of trade in economic recovery in Sri Lanka. Um, before we get started, I'd like to note that we do have live language interpretation in Sinhala and in Tamil. I think the instructions on how you can access the live language interpretation is on the screen now. Could we also have it shown in Tamil? Thank you. All right, so um, a few more comments before we officially kick off today's discussion. Um, please keep your microphone switched off for the duration of the session. Um, we'll be starting with a few introductory comments from Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana um, before the panel discussion kicks off, and we'll close with an audience Q&A. Uh, we do want to hear from you, uh, hear your questions, hear your, hear your thoughts. So please do send in your questions or comments um, on the Q&A function or on the chat on Zoom. Uh, you can also drop it in a comment on Facebook uh, and our team will collate those for, for, for us. Um, our event is, is live streamed today uh, on several Facebook pages. Um, the Morning, The Morning Business, Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, uh, Newshub.lk English, Economy Next, Echelon, BusinessNews.lk, Citizen.lk, Other, and Economy and Business Sri Lanka. So now that all the housekeeping is out of the way, um, Today's topic is an interesting one, and judging by the newspapers, a very important one. While Sri Lanka is currently facing yet another wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is having a very real human impact, it is unfortunate that at this moment, we must also be facing a rather difficult economic situation. So now more than ever, it is vital that we understand the role of trade and the opportunities it can present to Sri Lanka right now, and also on what hopefully will be a road to recovery in the months ahead. So without further ado, um, today we have with us uh, a panel of esteemed experts on this topic uh, who have kindly agreed to join us today. Um, we have with us, uh, we are honored to have with us His Excellency Dennis Chaibi, the ambassador of the delegation of the European Union to Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Um, his Excellency has previously served as the administrator for the EU's relations with India in the European Commission and on the personal staff of the Commissioner for Budget and Human Resources, Kristalina Georgieva, the, the present Managing Director of the IMF. Uh, Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana is the chair of the academic program at the Advocata Institute. Uh, he has worked at leading international organizations such as the World Bank, the WTO, the International Trade Center in Geneva, and the International Cooperative Alliance in Latin America. He's also the vice president of the Sri Lanka Economists Association. Professor Premachandra Atukorala is a professor of economics at the Arden Corden Department of Economics, College of Asia and the Pacific at the Australian National University. He is a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and an, honor and an honorary professor professorial research fellow at the University of Manchester. He is also an advisor to the Advocata Institute. Uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Daya Ratna Silva is an international trade economist with over 30 years of experience in the field. He has served as the National Project Coordinator of, of the International Trade Center in Sri Lanka. He is the former Senior Economic Affairs Officer at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and he is also the former Sri Lankan Ambassador to the WTO. Um, to all our panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. We are honored and we are quite excited for, uh, for the discussion. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to invite our panelists to um, turn their cameras on if possible. And I would like to pass the virtual mic on to Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana to make some introductory comments. Okay, make a very good Am I, am I on and I can't get the video start start video? Um, we can hear you, Dr. Yeah, now I can see. Right. Yeah, okay. Great. So sh sh shall we start then, Anita? Sure, let's go ahead. Yeah, now, okay. Thank you very much, Anita, for uh, moderating this uh, discussion. Uh, so I thought we'll have a few more uh, disc uh, in the introduction, few more things about what we are 
going to talk about today. Uh, as Anita mentioned, this is a very important subject matter for us, for this country. That is the relationship between international trade and uh, economic development and growth of Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, we see that trade will have a very important role to play, play uh, given that we have been, uh, before <coughs> even COVID started, we were already on a downtrend. We could not maintain the very high uh, GDP growth rate we achieved in 2010 after the end of the uh, war with LTT. And although it was, I think, one of the highest recorded, then it fizzled off. And then in 2020, because of COVID, it went down to minus 3.6% uh, decline in GDP growth rate. And so we are now battling uh, the, the we are, I think, taking some control of the, of the pandemic. Uh, some 31% of our population now uh, vaccinated. And still the, the important part of the getting economic recovery is uh, uh, equally important. Uh, in a way, uh, COVID and other uh, epidemics have a lifetime, you know, like being, but uh, if you have the economy neglected, that can last for even a longer time. So that's very important that we start uh, on uh, reforms that we have been, we have neglected, frankly, for the last, I would say, and people will disagree with what I would say, for 20 years. We have not made any substantial reforms to our economy, particularly on the trade side. And so, therefore, we cannot think about economic recovery without really starting with the trade reform. Actually, if you look at the world, how they are starting reforms, trade is a very somewhat of a favorite to start with because it's a very clear uh, thing to do uh, with tariffs and uh, other barriers, remove other barriers, barriers to trade, particularly quantitative barriers, but very important about, about uh, to reduce the tariffs. So we, uh, we have in our, uh, looking forward, we have to do uh, quite a, a good job of uh, starting our growth engine mostly by starting starting the uh, trade side uh, because trade side has has a very important part of getting uh, exposing the country to competition and with that the other uh, areas like uh, what we are going to do with the fiscal side uh, about the budget uh, and the monetary side about having a proper monetary policy that avoids inflation and. Uh, that is able to uh, lead to contribute to a more stable uh, exchange rate uh, uh, outcome. So, Adbarka is particularly uh, uh, focused on this issue. I think there are others also interested in this issue. We, we are particularly looking at today on the trade side. Already in our earlier uh, work on the uh, Trade side, uh, and so this is really, if you like, bit of a con it's a continuation, more focused on policy as such. What should we do going forward? That that is the issue we are going to uh, address. And so there are we are putting two things together. One is the uh, the economic the the dynamics of international uh, inter of growth, economic growth and what uh, trade can do to uh, support it and to get it going. And before I sort of really launch into trade side, I'll say a little background on the growth side. As I said, we were, began to say uh, growth has sort of faltered, uh, went to minus 3.6, that's of course uh, mostly due to COVID, but our decline, uh, tra tra trade, uh, I mean GDP growth rate began to decline before before COVID. So COVID only exacerbated the situation that was coming on. And then we can ask the question, why, why did it happen? Well, that, that happened because we didn't pay uh, enough attention to the incentive reforms in, in a very long time. We, we, as a country, did very well in the 1970s, particularly 77 onwards. 
then we had the war starting in 83. Uh, then more recently, there were problems in 2018 with some political kabuki, political problems with the coalition government. This we have, today we have a, uh, not a coalition government, a good, uh, uh, well integrated uh, government, um, and we uh, uh, have they have a very more than a two, they have two third majority, so they are in a really a, a good driving seat in order to undertake the reforms. If we can convince, and they are convinced that actually it's a sine qua non to get growth going to address the issue of trade. So, so that is the sort of main theme that we be devoting our time to. And now I go more directly to the trade situation. Uh, we, our trade regime, meaning the uh, exports, imports, and the rules that govern trade uh, are, need a lot of work. Uh, for example, we are right away, we have, our exports are one third of our imports, so imports are three times the size of exports. Uh, so we have a continuing uh, trade deficit. Uh, it's also accompanied by uh, current account deficit. These things have to be addressed. Uh, when we are talking about trade reform, you have to have to have macroeconomic support for it, which comes from uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy. And so, because with, without that, do, you don't have the sort of dynamic stability that you need in order to put into place a good reform program package. I think it is quite essential to do that. And so the question is, the easiest place to start is think about what are we going to do about the rate of protection of imports? What is the, what are the measures that are going to uh, encourage or get uh, reach higher growth rate? in exports. So that is really the basic uh, uh, issue that we have to face. Uh, what is very interesting uh, here is that more than the sort of the aggregates of uh, imports and exports, it's the inducement to, uh, it's the sort of Philip for or encouragement to uh, uh, productivity from having free to open trade. On, uh, non non restricted trade economic empirical evidence on sri lanka itself shows that it has a very uh, strong effect on the on uh, productivity and productivity itself is very importantly linked to the growth rate because if for example our growth were not based on productivity but on increasing increasing capital and labor and other factors land and all that it will always sustain it will, so it's a once and for all. So you, you need to keep on, uh, if you don't have a strong uh, growth in productivity, you have to keep on increasing the factors of production. <laughs> it's very difficult for, because you have to have more savings, that means less consumption. So the best way to get it done is to uh, really have a system in which our reforms are going to immediately uh, going to affect in the positive side of our uh, productivity growth, and so you can only use the word total factor productivity growth, including all the factors, the three or four factors together, how it uh, impacts on the growth rate. A lot of good people have looked into it and, and said maybe two, three very important things that you cannot sustain growth uh, without having productivity growth. One. Two is that even if you have a high growth rate, as we saw in 2009, at the end of the thing, it won't be sustained because it's not based on, uh, uh, on productivity. And also, uh, uh, what, what, what leads to productivity growth by the open economy, not only on the trade side, but say for foreign direct investment, which is lagging in our setup. You know, countries that have been growing very fast, it's no accident, like Vietnam, uh, even Bangladesh, uh, uh, Cambodia, Thailand have been growing fast because their productivity have been growing. So in other words, they had to keep on, they didn't have to keep on raising invest savings uh, in order to increase the rate of investment alone. So investment on one side and productivity on one side together are the sort of the necessary 
uh, support that you gave, gave to your growth going. So similar situation directly applies to us. These ingredients have to be present in our case also. And actually research by Bill Easterly and our Chantara uh, Devarajan has shown that in most cases, or the majority of the countries that they have looked, uh, high growth has been associated with high productivity growth. And, uh, and so if the if economy has been lagging behind, most of the time it is due to the fact that productivity growth has not really started or there has not been enough encouragement to do it. So what are the things that we can do to help our recovery? One thing is to lower our tariff rate, lower protection to begin with. We have high protection compared to our neighbors, compared to our competitors. Right? Something like if you take into account our para tariff, that is tariff put on existing tariffs uh, during the war period in order to finance the war, because we didn't have ways of raising revenue uh, in order to, for, to conduct the war, you know, we can, if you like, or whatever, whatever what is needed for a war. Um, so we still continue. So we have today 53% of our uh, average tariff is 53 percent when you take into account para tariff. So all the all the necessity for a para tariff is now not there because fortunately we don't have a war. And so, uh, but still it continues. So it, it's a sort of a, it, it hurts our competitiveness, our ability to for our exports to uh, grow faster and for, for our, our import substitution to be more, more widespread and more efficient. So it's it's one of the fundamental things we have to do, reduce the data protection. The countries that have grown very fast that we have from the East Asian experience is that they, uh, they, uh, they, they reduce their tariffs and they, of course, they had an earlier period of protection when they saw what was happening in the rest of the world and when uh, the countries in Asia show the importance of uh, the trade reforms in the countries that are growing very fast, in the case of uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Hong Kong. Hmm? Uh, and so uh, uh, we, we learned from that 65 year, 70 period, a good lesson. Uh, so we would say, uh, Reduce our tariff. Get first, get rid of the para tariffs. Actually, it's easy to do. It can be do by uh, by just uh, putting the regulation in. Uh, get get rid of it. Actually, do it fast and so that you are sending a message also that they are serious. So don't. Some people have argued in the, have been in such meetings. Yeah, let's do over five years. No, five. If you are going to do it five years, you are particularly in the case of para tariffs. You are signaling that you are not, you know, you want to go slow. No, you have to really do uh, medium. You can get the message by very strong reform, very strong action uh, on, uh, on 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 para tariffs. Then uh, simple other things that uh, some people favor, and I am one of them. A single a uniform tariff. You know, who country that been having a very good success with single uniform tariff? The Current Russia, 17% uh, uniform tariff. So the, it very easy to administer such a system and there are no distortions in the tariff system. Uh, effective rates of protection are also pro, uh, as in, uh, easy to predict in such a situation. So as a sort of a um, suggestion, it, is it possible that we could do a uniform tariff uh, and our tariffs might be lower than uh, our competitors because we have been robbed of competition because we have ma maintained the high uh, high protectionist regime all this time. Although we were the second to do it after Chile, Chile did in 1974, did in 1977. Then as a so more housekeeping things, eliminate specific tariffs. You know, make, make it all a based on value. It's easy to do, easy to administrate administer it and easy to see what is the, the results of it. And make tariffs the only form of protection. Because if you introduce the quantitative restriction as we had in the past, then it's going to create problems. Because one of the big problems is that it can lead to a sort of a tariff regime that is very difficult to predict uh, as the work of Bhagwati and Hans Riegel shows. It's a, there's a chaotic system of uh, uh, tariffs if you, if, 
uh, for protection in such a way. Uh, so it, it is not a bad idea. Uh, my suggestion is to have a, a uniform tariff and for 15%, which we can reduce over time uh, as our economy takes off, I mean, COVID is ending and uh, and the government commits itself to good reform program. We can, we can signaling not only our countrymen, but our creditors and would be creditors that we are pretty serious of what we are going to do. And we are trying our best to get the growth rate going. And we need a growth rate, you know, back for the analog calculation growth rate that, uh, that is higher than the average rate of uh, interest that we pay on our debt. That's really simple uh, first year uh, macro. <laughs> so, uh, so that is my suggestion. We can later have a discussion on it as we proceed. And thank you very much, Anita. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Raj Patrina, for those, for those introductory remarks. Uh, before we move on to the discussion, I'd like to let the audience know that the language interpreters are here. Um, and you, if you want, you can access uh, an interpretation of today's event in both Sinhala and Tamil. Instructions are in the chat box. Uh, this is available on Zoom. Um, so uh, Dr. Raj Patanan, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting start to our conversation today. Um, particularly, I, was, I would like to for us to maybe think of, to, to, to tackle the point that you spoke about, where you highlighted the importance of us having lower protection and ideally having only tariffs as a form of protection. Um, if we are to see this kind of sustained growth uh, for Sri Lanka, that, that the country is in quite dire need of. Um, if I could, um, uh, if I could direct this question uh, to His Excellency the Ambassador, uh, because at this moment, uh, Sri Lanka's economy is in a rather precarious position. Uh, and how important is it that we retain our GSP plus position? Uh, we have lost it in the past. Uh, are we going to see a repeat of this? Um, and what, what are the consequences uh, in light of the comments that Dr. Raj Patrana has now shared? Thank you. Um, well, GSP was granted, GSP plus was granted first in 2005, then withdrawn in 2010, and then reinstated in 2017, uh, but with some conditions. And among these conditions, there was uh, the commitment of the government to review uh, the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Um, I mean, just to, to frame things for those who are not uh, familiar, the generalized system of preferences plus means that two thirds of the tariff lines uh, get uh, uh, access to the EU market with reduced or no uh, tariff. So it's a serious um, advantage. There are only eight countries that have that advantage. So it is uh, uh, particularly beneficial uh, to Sri Lanka. And if I go into that, um, you know, the risk of losing it and, uh, and how beneficial it is, so now people talk a lot about it because there was a European Parliament resolution uh, on the 10th of June, 2010. And I've heard many, many interpretation of that resolution <laughs> over the last uh, uh, two months. So I will read um, precisely the terms of, of that resolution. It says, after explaining all the difficulties in terms of human rights uh, in Sri Lanka, it says um, that the European Parliament calls on the Commission. And it's important here to know that the, the Commission is the executive of, of the EU, roughly speaking, and has uh, the right and the competence to look at the GSP+. It's, it's only the commission that proposes, it has the uh, exclusive right of initiative. So it's the commission uh, power. So the European Parliament invites the commission and the uh, European External Action Service to use the GSP+, plus as a leverage to push for advancement on Sri Lanka's human rights obligations and demand the repeal or replacement of the PTA, to carefully assess whether there is sufficient reason as a last resort to initiate a procedure for the temporary withdrawal of Sri Lanka's GSP plus status. So it's a last resort, um, it's a temporary withdrawal and it has to be based on if there's a sufficient reason. So that's a very specific process. Now, what are the advantages of GSP plus for Sri Lanka? Um, 
first of all, for the government, I think it's it's positive for any government as being seen engaging in uh, basic human rights um, and implementing the goals and values of all democracies. I think that any government would take pride in this and, and uh, with the context that we have with the government, we can see that there's real engagement. Um, but more than that, um, GSP Plus provide quite a lot of foreign currency uh, to Sri Lanka at the time where foreign currency seemed to be particularly precious to the country. So uh, not benefiting from it would certainly have an impact uh, on the uh, balance of payment situation, which is already uh, a cause of, of for concern. And also um, GSP Plus through this economic uh, benefit provide a lot of employment. A lot of people have more work thanks to GSP Plus. That's for the immediate uh, impact. Then there's a kind of um, uh, more long-term uh, view. There's the second group of reasons why it's important. Um, we've seen with COVID-19 that it's important to have resilient supply chain and to try to get into the supply chain without having a preferential access to the EU is going to be more difficult for Sri Lanka. Uh, also, competitiveness. Uh, Bangladesh and Vietnam have been uh, mentioned. So Bangladesh and Vietnam uh, are not in the same situation of Sri Lanka. Vietnam doesn't have G uh, GSP+. Plus, But Vietnam has increased its imports, uh, its exports to the EU over the last, I mean, between 2010 and 2019 by 400%. And Bangladesh by 150%. Uh, Sri Lanka has only increased its import compared to 2010 by 60%, and half of it is um, thanks to the GSP Plus reinstatement in 2017. So, competitively, Sri Lanka is engaged in a sort of race with the other up and coming countries in the region. And to now, at this juncture, uh, not benefit from GSP Plus would really question the competitiveness of Sri Lanka compared to these countries that are catching up quickly. Um, and also with the GSP plus, um, many exporters, especially in the garment uh, industry, but also fish tires um, are focused on the EU market. And the EU market is a competitive one. It's very open, uh, but it's also one of high standards, high added value, high prices. So by maintaining this focus, uh, Sri Lanka can try to keep up with its competitivity, especially compared to the others. And then finally, and I will stop here to put this in the larger prospect of the economic recovery, um, GSP Plus has, has a lot of potential. It can be used more intensively. At the moment, only 60% of, uh, of the total use allowed is, is, is implemented by the industry. So more integration and more also linked with uh, uh, the supply chain could uh, improve that, but also, done in the right way and with other economic reforms, it could really send a signal to investors, uh, uh, to, um, to people who want to trade, that Sri Lanka is open for business. But that depends on other measures. But it, its value could be amplified, so the potential is big. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, so in particular, um, I found interesting the point uh, that the Ambassador made uh, on Sri Lanka's competitiveness of our exports um, and that we don't seem to be keeping up with our, uh, with our peers in the region. Um, Professor Premachand Ratakorale, if I could um, ask you to, to jump in at this point um, and weigh in here, um, particularly because in the past, when we've seen a growth in Sri Lanka's uh, trade, uh, notably uh, once the economy was opened in the late 70s uh, and in the 80s, and we had this shift towards manufacturing and services, um, that, that, that shift drove a lot of the growth uh, in that time period for the country. If we are to recover from our present uh, crunch in terms of uh, our present economic crunch, how would we be able to, uh, to up our game in terms of trade competitiveness and integrate better into global markets? Professor Premachandra Tukorele, are you, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Uh, we can't I see you, but that's fine. You can you can continue. We'll, yeah, we'll... I, I'll put no no. I'll I'll. Yeah, now you can see me. Yeah, uh, Anita, 
uh, if it's okay with you, what I am going to do now is take about 10 to 12 minutes to make, uh, add to some of the key points uh, Dr. Raj Rajapatan has made in order to provide the setting for the discussion. Would it be fine with you? I mean, I will cover what you ask. And uh, in addition to that, I think we need a little bit structure for the uh, uh, discussion uh, to ask, get questions from the audience and so on. Uh, let me begin by saying that if any sensible policymaker in newly developing countries in the region, in Vietnam, Cambodia, or our latest donor, uh, Bangladesh, listen to his speech, they would not raise any question. They will just uh, shake their, nod their head to say, agree with everything. Now, this debate about whether we should backtrack from open door policy, uh, I think it is unique to Sri Lankan uh, policy debate, right? Uh, what we he really hear in this debate, it uh, what we were taught at Peradhan University in the early 70s. Now in other countries, the debate is virtually settled. If you want to achieve self-sustained growth, development, that means growth with poverty reduction, there is no other way than global economy integration. And uh, this view is accepted everywhere in this region, uh, perhaps other than in uh, uh, North Korea. But, and Sri Lanka is unique, I think. We are talking about an old issue which has already been resolved in other countries. Now, I am going to structure my presentation uh, to focus on four themes relating to Dr. Rajapatirna's presentation. Firstly, I'm going to make some opening remarks about the role of outward orientation in sustained economic development. Then I'm going to comment on what you, the central bank report called its novel economic policy. To me, it is novel, not novel. This is what uh, uh, our old policymakers treat uh, in the 70s. I'm going to discuss a little bit about this so-called novel economic policy. Then if time permits, if you don't cut me off, I want to tell a little bit about the role of FTAs in our development strategy, whether it can play a useful role. And then I'm going to tell a little bit about abuse of the term value-added trade, how it is inconsistent with uh, global economic integration in this uh, current gl global context. Let me begin with, you can uh, give me a signal if I'm taking time, right? Firstly, what is the role of trade orientation in economic development? When you read Sri Lankan newspapers so or listen to policymakers, they give a simple answer. We need exports to earn foreign exchange, right? The, the focus is on maintaining balance of payment position, but it's a very simplistic way of looking at the role of economic uh, integration or export orientation in economic development. Uh, we know that export orientation work as an engine of economic development. Uh, in addition to meeting balance of payment requirements, export contribute to economic dynamism in three ways. Uh, firstly, uh, in a developing country, our comparative advantage in international trade lies in relatively labor intensive production processes, right? We trade it relatively developed countries, which are more capital and technology intensive. We are relatively more labor intensive. Therefore, 
export oriented growth is the sure fire way to reduce poverty right uh, export orientation mold or change your production structure in line with your comparative advantage it generate more employment labor is the only resource owned by the poor therefore employment generation mean injecting money to the poor therefore no country in the world has achieved growth with equity poverty reduction poverty reduction on a sustainable way, basis without global economic integration look at china when china started the reform process 50% of people lived below the poverty line over the last three decades poverty rate in china had declined to less than 1% simply because uh, deng xiaoping opened up the coastal area to trade and foreign investment every year 15 million workers moved from the countryside to, uh, to the urban labor intensive production processes that was the key to uh, poverty reduction in china it happened in a small way in india indian reforms have been half hearted but still the poverty rate has been significantly reduced during the reform era 1991 after uh, i have been working on vietnam in vietnam there has been a dramatic reduction in poverty rate because of global economic integration through export oriented growth then that is the first point why export oriented development is needed second is scale economies think about a tiny country aiming to achieve a 6% growth rate can you achieve that by focusing with the domestic market it is impossible uh, to give you an example uh, look at mauritius mauritius of the prison for our political uh, prisoners during the colonial period right it's an island with 1.2 million population but their per capita income is three times of ours why that happened they embraced export led growth well before us in the early 70s and because of the draconian protectionist policy we missed this type of opportunity think about a company like mars or brandix employing more than 50000 workers can you imagine a company like that emerging uh, with a domestic market oriented focus we need scale economies scale economies come from global economic integration therefore that is the second point the third point is what dr raj patarna said uh, productivity improvement no country in the world has achieved productivity impro- improvement on a sustainable basis within a closed economy framework when you open the economy uh, producers face import competition at the same time exporters need to maintain maintain quality standard they have to emulate uh, state of the art technology therefore productivity improvement is positively related with export orientation because of these three reasons Uh, firstly restructure in the economy's production process in line with your comparative advantage and generate in employment to reduce poverty secondly scale economy factor and thirdly uh, the point i made about productivity all these factors taken together lead to the inference that trade is not simply a balance of payment filling device but it is an engine of economic development 
Now, let me, with that background, uh, let me move to the second uh, 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 subtopic, which is the so-called uh, new economic policy framework. How it is consistent with our development priorities. I would say in a short sentence, actually, this can be a development disaster if we follow this policy. And uh, still the government has not come up with a definite policy statement and government uh, appointed the presidential commission. It came up with the report, but the only source for us is the central bank report. On page 20, there is about half a page about uh, economic development policy. To me, that half a page is full of slogans. There is no analysis to support the central bank policy prescriptions. Either our policy directions have to be guided by what is happening in other countries in the region, right? Uh, or it has to be guided by our own economic history. What have we achieved on the limited economic opening? What are the disadvantages of the closed economy? These things are never, they are not discussed uh, in the report, but they say that in order to solve our uh, issues, uh, we need privatizing winning industries and emphasize domestic production. Then based on the presidential report, they have come up with 11 product lists. We don't know how these are selected. That is one product called electronic and electrical goods. There is another category called machinery. Uh, I can't see the difference between the two, but whatever it is, it is a ad hoc product selection. Now, I want to uh, make three points relating to uh, this proposed strategy. Firstly, the proposed strategy, the selection of the production mix is not consistent with what I call global production sharing, which has been the driving force behind economic globalization uh, over the last three to four decades. Globe countries have gained export development uh, in Asian region, including Vietnam recently, by joining global production networks. And uh, no country in the world now produce a good from the beginning to end within the given uh, uh, geographical boundaries. Countries specialize in different segments within the production value chain of given manufactured goods. Uh, in other words, the made in the made in the country X label has become invalid over the last three decades. Most of the products are made in the world, right? Country, a country has to identify compared to advantage within the production network. According to my estimate, this product list, 11 product lists, actually central bank say there can be many more added to this, right? In this product list, 85 to 90% are traded within global production networks. Countries specialize in part and components and final assembly. And uh, the old idea that a country produce a good from beginning to end in the given location and trade with other countries. In other words, the so-called uh, Ricardian example, trade for wine for cloth is no longer valid for about two thirds of world production. Now, well, central bank advocacy is entirely based on that outdated concept of countries specializing in goods from beginning to end. These type of goods are disappearing, right? 
And uh, actually, when you look at our export experience over the last 40 years, there have been some dynamic uh, industries within global value chain emerging. Uh, there are companies producing car component, right? There are uh, at least 10 companies producing component for cars. And uh, there is a company in Kadavate producing component for Airbus. I mean, these type of activities are not even mentioned in this report, right? That is my first comment about uh, the central bank or the government advocacy. It is out of line, uh, context uh, with global changes in international production. Then second point is uh, selective intervention. Uh, it says that government has to pick up winning industries. And these are the winning industries they say. Of course, when you look at experiences of Korea or Taiwan, we can identify few cases of government intervention doing very well, success cases. But at the same time, <coughs> we can identify hundreds and thousands of failed cases during the import substitution era. Even from Sri Lanka, we can pick up at least a uh, couple of hundred failed cases, right? Then one should not uh, generalize from few cases when we talk about national development policy. Now, uh, people like Ha Jun Chen will be coming to address uh, Central Bank uh, in a few weeks' time. They identify some success cases and tell fairy tales. But when you analyze these cases, you can see that these successes have three inherent features. Firstly, the incentives given to these specific industries had been strictly time bound. In Korea or Taiwan, when they protect an industry, it would be for five years or three years, not beyond that. The second feature of this selective industrialization strategy is export performance requirement to, was strictly imposed on the beneficiary firm. Uh, in Korea and Taiwan, when the government give uh, protection, they say that within five year time, you have to become a dynamic exporter. Thirdly, selective intervention was introduced without disturbing the incentive structure in the country. Competitiveness of export production was preserved while protecting these industries. Actually, I have a quotation from uh, uh, Park Chun here, but I don't have time to show it. I will show it later. Park Chun He even maintained a prison, right? It was called Siudado Mum, uh, next to his uh, palace. Actually, once he introduced incentives, if exporters do not meet this incentive requirement, he framed cases and put them in jail. I mean, can you do these type of things in tiny Sri Lanka with a fragile political system, right? And uh, when you have the Central Bank report advocate selective intervention without, while ignoring the fact that these special cases highlighted by Ha Jun Chan, Amsterdam, and others had very unique features relating to their governance structure. In this country, can you do that? That is uh, my question. Thirdly, if you want to give incentives, you had to select industries in a very careful way. Now, here the list include everything other than 
ready-made garment, which is the most successful case. It is missing in the list. And then say, we protect these 31 big industries and there can be many more. And this is a recipe for disaster. Every manufacturer is not now going to ask for protection, right? Uh, protection is for grab for them, right? When the list is not limited. Therefore, because of these three reasons. Firstly, product selection is virtually has ignored the global phenomena of global production sharing, which has been the driving force of manufactured export expansion in the world. If you look at East Asian countries, out of their total export, more than 80% is part and component and final assembly, not goods produced from the beginning to end, even the given the country location. The second point I made is that they talk about selective intervention, but they have ignored why selective intervention has worked in some countries. Why do we have these preconditions in Sri Lanka. Thirdly, when you come up with a vastly, vast list and say that we are going to give incentives, it is it opens up a market for, uh, I mean, the demand for protection. Protection is grabbed for bargaining uh, by the protectionist lobby. Therefore, when you take all this uh, point into account, but uh, in a nutshell, this policy U-turn is going to be uh, a recipe for disaster. Then I think I have taken a lot of time. The next two points I want to highlight is firstly, the FTA debate, whether FTAs can help export expansion, uh, then the value-added myth. Uh, I leave it uh, for discussion later. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Atgorala. Um, that was a very, very interesting insight and explanation into how where trade is moving and what Sri Lanka has been doing or not doing rather when it comes to trade policy, among many other things. Um, Dr. Dayaratna, if I could, uh, ask you to jump in here because now we have heard um, from Dr. Rajapatrana, from um, the ambassador, from Professor Atukorala, and the sort of uh, a few a few themes seem to be common uh, in 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 the in the insights that have come out. Uh, we are not taking full advantage of the benefits given to us through GSP Plus. Um, we're not as competitive as our peers in the region. Uh, as Professor Atukorala highlighted, uh, if the future of trade and indeed where trade is right now is in global production networks uh, and we haven't integrated sufficiently or even probably started properly integrating at all, um, what is that going to do to Sri Lanka's trade position overall? Um, you come from a background from uh, extensive background where you have uh, uh, with the WTO and, and Sri Lanka has been a member since since 1995. Um, in this context, can you can you give us a bit of um, perspective as to how we can improve our trade policy to address the current economic position that Sri Lanka is in and improve our trade competitiveness? Um, for example, I think the, the ambassador highlighted how in, in light of COVID, it is, it is trade has actually proved uh, to be even more important. Although at the start of the pandemic, people were a little wary. Um, now, you know, two years on, it is quite clear that we need uh, resilient supply chains. We need to have these connections with the rest of the world. Um, and of course, as Dr. Rajapatran highlighted, we need to be competitive. We need to drive productive growth through our trade. Um, it was a slightly long question to you, Dr. Dayaratna, but if you would be up to tackling that. Yes, thank you very much. I can't switch on my video. Could you? That's fine, Dr. Dayaratna. We can hear you clearly. Okay. First of all, let me thank you, uh, 
organizing this uh, discussion. Uh, I would say it is very timely. As you mentioned, today we are in a crisis. The circumstances are not normal and not just a crisis, we are in a severe crisis because we hear a lot of news because, because this crisis is because we it is manifested due to the inability to manage our dealings on the external front. So in that context, you ask the right question, what is the role of the trade policy to get out of this? In fact, you ask me so many questions. So what is, what would be required? And I hope this kind of debate would finally provide inputs for the current policy makers to select the right set of policies, policy prescriptions to put the country into the long sustainable development path. Now, with this question, I would first like to deal with the in a WTO setting, WTO rules, and the current policy, trade policy prescription that government, Sri Lankan government has put in place, how, how they are and what are the implications. Now, as announced by the government, Anita, you know, the, with the onset of the first wave of the COVID, you know, government introduced exceptionally broad import controls, starting from the blanket import ban. This, what they say is, is a trade policy, is necessary to reduce import and ease pressure on the exchange rate and lower rate. Very interestingly, this is a justification from the government side, but one can raise eyebrows with series of questions. This is what I'm going to ask overall, you know, your series of questions. Did the Sri Lankan government employed or opted for more suitable option available? Were there any other alternatives? Handling the situation, say, consistent with the WTO rule. Most importantly, were these measures, you know, as Dr. Rajapatirina said, he, I'll, de I, I'll not reflect what he said, would have the best interests of the country's economy, or most importantly, you know, the business community. Now, before I reflect, I think there are many people I would like to briefly tell about this WTO, because I hear, I hear very, sometimes very, you know, what is WTO? We don't, we don't want to bother about WTO, right? Right? But, uh, I would like to say a bit of uh, jurisprudence of, you know, the WTO import control and this discussion is required. WTO is, you know, commonly referred to as the multilateral trading system is the only powerful international organization that provides what I call predictable, efficient, efficiently functioning system to regulate huge amount of international trade. When I say huge, I just look at the like 2019 figures, 19 trillion US dollars worth of export global. So we need rules. This is because this amount of, amount of trade is because there are rules. 
trades are conducted according to the rules. So therefore, you know, this expansion of the Chinese now, I, I know that, uh, you know, with the Chinese accession in 2001, I was in Geneva, you know, uh, more than 97% of the world trade is now gone by the WTO. Therefore, very important, very important. We align with this rule. We follow the rule. Now, I am, now next, let me come to the key question. What the WTO rules say about the import control? You know, you know WTO rules, you know, there is a particular provision, Article 11.1 or whatever, very clear on that. It says, I mean, this is pertaining to the general elimination of the quantitative restriction. You know, they are, you know, prescription is very precise and very comprehensive. You know, this rule has been further elaborated, you know, what do you call the WTO panels and the case law. Accordingly, you know, what we Sri Lanka opted for complete ban, quantitative reactions are completely prohibited. Other than it says duties and taxes and charges, right? If I use the precise language, get language, what it says is contracting parties, oh, now it is WTO members, shall not institute or maintain quantitative or import restriction other than taxes and this. Now, what are these quantitative restrictions? They are come to, I mean, very basic level. I must say they are quotas, import ban, you know, uh, various form of Chinese policy. You know, why this provision is there? One has to understand because contradicting restrictions are by nature considered to have what do you call greater protective effect? effect. Dr. Rajapatina explained why this distortion will damage the free trade, right? So I don't know. That. You know, than the tariff measures. So the Sri Lankan government introduced arbitrary, contrative, that will distort trade. So, you know, this is the crisis today. We, I mean, now uh, is not, uh, this is, this was, I mean, the way that country reversing the reform agenda, this kind of situation, any economists, this was expected. Nothing, nothing, nothing. This was the, this was expected the outcome. So, um, why they say this distorting, there are many issues, but I, let me confide to two, three, four, very briefly, because time is very short. When I <laughs> give you some, <laughs> economic reason is that we as consumer, you are a consumer, you know, we like to have a good quality product and, you know, at a reasonable uh, price. What the quantitative restriction deny or impair the access of foreign products, which are available for the consumers, right? So, Consumer in this country, I have participated in, I had the opportunity to, you know, various position. Consumer interest is, the, is not in the analysis, right? The least, this is an important group there. I will give you some very specific example, but what they mean. Then the second is, quantitative restriction, benefit only to the rent seekers. I emphasize, there are rent seekers in this country. How it happens? Again, very simple to understand. In simple economics, you know, you have international price and the domestic price. So disparity between the, what do you call the international price and domestic price, caused by the quantitative restriction become a rent. Rent that the profit, those who own these license or whatever, right? Um, my worry is most importantly the 
implication for the long term development long term industrial development of this our country because if the bees badly implemented quantitative restriction have a detrimental impact on the long term development of the industrial development in the country this is true i think again dr rajabhadra this is what you call the inefficient allocation of resources on the contrary you think the our domestic industries are open to you know the foreign competition they will streamline productivity they will use new technology to improve product quality and the competitiveness of prices so an efficient allocation of resources will take place but unfortunately you know um, this quantitative restrictions on our place and gradually they were introducing taking away from import ban and introduce a system of cof um, import licensing this i call self imposed non tariff barriers to growth self imposed but these are you know other countries if you look at the other countries in the region they are moving away from the import ban import licensing all that so here it is a situation you are adding another cumbersome for the our traders the trading community who suffer well to sum up this section i don't want to give more detail i am very impressed you know that you mentioned the economist economy economists no economists right you know there was a young uh, young researcher dr asanka vijayasanga of the ipl he has summarized very nicely about this uh, import control and you know what he said this to the resource allocation domestic manufacturing uh, discourage the yeah, you know and the possibility of the possibility of the, this is the another last one which i want to make possibility of the tariff literary retaliation because i was in do, do, in geneva about 70 years yes right by trading partners because and the eu ambassador his excellency ambassador did not mention eu has raised many time of this one about this import ban because prolonged import ban control are not simply not consistent with the wto and high time to we address this one then you know the why my recommendation is move away at least from the qr but wto rules allow you to use your tariff sri lanka has you know industrial tariff only 35% we have what you call bound you have enough room to use the tariff tariff again i'm not going to use uh, time you know tariff is a better option than quantitative restriction because tariffs are transparent they tariff generate uh, you know revenue for the government and they link with the foreign prices an automatic link to the price right now now i want to dwell on the very important issue dr rajapatna i hope i am not taking much time very uh, uh, is that okay right important issue what sort of tariff structure we should have to tell you the truth if you i usually peruse with the when you go to the wto tariff profile across the country if you just peruse it right sri lanka has the very complicated tariff structure what i call what many economists call two tier tariff structure what they says we have a first layer what do you call the custom duty and all these countries have this layer in sri lanka or and about this custom duty we have a plethora of other duties and charges and dr patel you know charatra patel mentioned whole para tariff what do you call the uh, i will tell you a nice story about the para tariff says right this para tariff in the current policy circle is the taboo word 
ban word, don't talk about it. If you do, this is not the interest of the Sila. So that's all. Okay. The para tariff are listed in a separate column. And this is a Sri Lankan invention. Not that I was involved in the Pakistan trade FTA negotiation. At the negotiation table, what they humbly requested was, okay, you can, Excellency, you can keep your existing tariff, don't introduce more. But about one month or two months later, we introduced more and more partners. So violating this. Now, I'm, because it is justified at that time, like the Dr. Rajapati Rana mentioned, the ballooning war budget, it is that there is no longer, there is no war. You can easily address this issue. Um, now, uh, you know this, uh, um, I want to give, uh, reflect on the paratory, uh, you know, in, in, you know, the introduced, they are in the, what do you call, specific, duty, so unit taxes, meaning, you know, unit taxes on the basis of per unit. This is the, this makes the, comes the worst to worst. Okay. I, I give a, a Dr. typical. Dr. Dharatna, could I ask you to wrap up after this point? Okay, okay. very you. important example. This is what you call the per unit basis foot pair. If you take the foot pair, per pair is, thousand dollar thousand rupees or five dollars right so if you convert this unit tax into ad valorem tax right you will see what i will say it appears that our tariff structure is anti-poor i want to explain this to you please give me a time why anti-poor and pro-industrialist you know pair of shoes you know who used this 500 rupees coming at the CIS? So if you impose 1,000 rupees, it becomes 1,500, right? Who buy this low quality shoes? Our rural farmers, right? Imagine you have a, what do you call that is 500 rupees, you have a 50% tax, fine. So it go, jump to the 750 rupees. Now with the paratari for 1,000, it jumped to the 1,500. A farmer in Hangurangato or, or Anradapura, what will happen is, he, suppose he has a, he, he only income with the, you know, the rice. Per kilo, he gets 75 at the wholesale. So if it is only a 50% tariff that comes to 750, he has to sell only how many? You know, the 10 kilos of rice. But with this para tariff, we have to, how many, 20 kilos. I can give you many examples in this sanitary and where, you know, therefore, uh, you know, this anti-poor tariffs, anti-poor unit tariff, this tariff factor, for the interest of over improving our trade relations, but for the benefit of our rural and the poor people has to be dealt with. I hope these policymakers understand the very, Simple economy. There are many things I think I will. Uh, I wanted to give a good example of this Cambodia footwear, which is a LDC country. Please give me a one minute, one minute more. Footwear industry in Cambodia today export, export with a population of 16 million people, less than you know the Sri Lankan population, one million worth of footwear. Provide job nearly one million, you know, one sorry, one billion export, providing one billion. So, so what is the what I, the argument is we you know we are tariff structure should be prepared to come of the industries that generate employment, activity, help the poor. This is what the role of the trade policy is. Thank you very much. I have if you have any question, I am very happy to explain. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dairatna Silva. Um, I would, uh, I, Dr. Dairatna Silva touched on, on many very important points, uh, but uh, one thing that kind of stood out was uh, was his explanation of, of 
import restrictions and the issues that come about when import restrictions or quotas are put in place. Um, and uh, I would really like to hear what um, the ambassador uh, of the EU delegation um, has to say on this topic, because I believe the EU has also uh, sort of realized the, 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 the consequences to the, the continued uh, import restrictions of varying degrees on varying tariff lines that we have seen over the past almost two years now. Uh, and I believe they've released a statement on this as well. Uh, and as one of our largest trading partners, um, we have heard the perspective from, uh, uh, from, from the point of view of Sri Lankan economists, but from the perspective of our trading partners, what why should we be concerned about these import restrictions and the trade, the, the direction that trade policy has taken in the last few years? Thank you. Um, first of all, I I should uh, mention uh, in in response to Dr. Silva that I didn't raise the issue myself because I was not uh, asked and I was trying to limit the time that I was speaking. But obviously, this is very high on the agenda of the EU. Uh, but it's from a different point of view. Um, the importance um, of, of these restrictions for, for the Sri Lankan economy is, is better assessed by the economists and, and by the Sri Lankans. But from a European point of view, our problem is not so much uh, the deficit, uh, and we have a serious uh, trade deficit with Sri Lanka, I mean, in relative terms, but it's about the rules. The EU tries to have a rule-based order, and a rule-based order in all areas is, you know, benefits smaller countries. Um, the EU is particular in the sense that many small countries uh, uh, are clustered together and with a couple of uh, bigger ones. But that means that the, the values that drive the EU are also inspired by this rule-based organization. And so when one country that has subscribed to certain uh, basic rules in trade do not respect them, we feel that the whole architecture is at stake because if nothing happens, uh, if everyone can make uh, restrictions without notifying them, without giving a clear uh, end date, without giving a clear um, insight on how um, they will uh, pan out, then we have a difficulty. Um, as I said, the trade uh, relation between Sri Lanka and EU is very beneficial to Sri Lanka. Uh, for the last 10 years, uh, Sri Lanka has had a surplus that is quite consequent for its economy, and the EU has never tried to change the situation. It's the economy at work, private sector at work. But now, with the import restrictions, the situation has changed in the sense that this, this year, 2020, was the lowest export of EU to Sri Lanka in the last 10 years. So now we can see that the combination of COVID plus the import restrictions really um, puts us in, a, in an imbalance that is not right. And it's not right because it's not according to the rules. And if everyone can flout the rules, then it will be very difficult to, to keep uh, uh, the trade flowing. And without trade for a, a medium-sized, small island in the ocean, the prospects are not good. So we take it from a rule point of view, and it's very high on, on the agenda. I've raised it uh, several times. And if there are no more uh, uh, action uh, on this, uh, we will have to, you know, further uh, our coordination with like-minded partners in, in the WTO. Just as I said in, in other fora, we fully, fully understand the balance of payment issues. So if the measures uh, can be explained through that, fine, but they need to be explained, which means notification to WTO, rationale, and also how the situation will pan out and uh, will be uh, run down. So we need to have these details, otherwise we are not in respect with the rules. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I think we might just take one more question um, from, uh, just take one more point uh, with the panelists and then we'll open up uh, for audience questions. Um, Dr. Rajpatrina, if I could uh, ask you to weigh in here, uh, leading from what the ambassador also highlighted very interestingly, his point about uh, Sri Lanka's surplus with the EU and 
because this is a this is a point that comes out quite often in media and in discussions in Sri Lanka. This question of uh, we have a trade deficit. Uh, this is a problem. How do we narrow the trade deficit? Um, and and this has been that conversation has been quite closely tied to the point of okay, we need to bring in uh, place these restrictions. We need to reduce our imports in order to drive our exports up and and uh, and and create uh, either a surplus in our trade surplus or to at least at the very least reduce our trade deficit. But could you? Could you explain to us a little bit more from an economic perspective and in terms of the practical impact it has on Sri Lankans um, and whether this thinking is really quite in the right direction? Actually, a single um, uh, country having a deficit with another country in the global system is not a very serious problem unless the single country is in dire states and, uh, had, and also signed agreements uh, to conduct uh, the, its affairs in line with the World Trade Organization rules and regulations. So I am a great respecter of uh, WTA rules because at the end of the day, it's like a public good that everybody benefits from it. It's like your traffic rules. You know, if you follow the uh, value on the left-hand side in Sri Lanka, that, that's a very important rule. If, if they don't follow it, there is much more accidents in the world, in, the, in this country. So similarly for trade, uh, the set of rules guarantees that trade to go uh, flow easily from one country to another. It is the basis of our growth. I mean, if you don't have that, then we are in real trouble. And But uh, some of the things that you see as trade problems are really macroeconomic problems. So we have to make a distinction between uh, rather than a single country, single deficit, whether we are conducting our uh, economic policies, trade policies in this case, uh, properly, uh, you know, uh, if keeping to the world rules in what uh, first Dr. Aratna explained. So I, uh, I don't worry so much and I maybe I'm, I am not doing justice to it, what single deficit to single country, but I would say I would worry about a larger question of import of substitution, substitution and um, that leads to great inefficiencies, domestic allocation of resources. And um, that, uh, that what you see in the balance of payments is a, is a manifestation of what has happened inside. That's oh. my contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raj Pathirana. Um, for our audience, I'd like to also highlight that we have a deep dive episode with Dr. Raj Pathirana, which is a primer on international trade from theory to practice, um, the case of Sri Lanka. Um, so this, uh, this video is available on the Advocata website and on our Facebook. You can also find it on all our social media. And I would highly recommend uh, that if you found this discussion interesting to go ahead uh, and give that a watch um, as Dr. Ajpatina lays out the basics um, of trade for uh, in, in a quite understandable uh, but yet nuanced way. Um, so, uh, but uh, Dr. Raj Patran, if I could ask you to very briefly comment uh, and on uh, on what you said in terms of import substitution, something I believe you touched on in your deep dive was this uh, was uh, was the term efficient import substitution. And this is something that people found quite interesting because right now there's a lot of conversation about import substitution. But could you uh, very briefly, if possible, uh, give, a, give, a, give an explanation as to what efficient import substitution would look like? So, by, uh, yeah, we are not against, I mean, the, that's the mainstream economists uh, that I define as the people who have been quoted in advanced texts in economics. Uh, make the point. That is that uh, you can, if you break down uh, uh, a trade regime into uh, into two parts, into exports and imports, uh, good economic uh, practice, good economic policy is where you have uh, a similar status for efficient import substitution and export promotion. So import substitution takes place 
uh, when 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 you replace the, the import import if if you uh, replace it to the domestic production, but the domestic production must be efficient. Uh, the otherwise, what happens is that because of barriers that I introduce, it uh, it reduces the welfare of the population. So they pay higher prices uh, when with a more competitive system. If you if you are an efficient import substitution case, then you don't have to worry about it because mm -hmm. that means that uh, you are able to uh, produce a lower cost. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you had to produce, if you come and go and create uh, industries or, uh, or whatever you produce, keeping it afloat by subsidies and things, then it's a, not an efficient thing. Mm -hmm. So the market test is a very good, important thing. If, if a country, if an industry cannot mm -hmm. uh, exist as a private industry, uh, in the market needs help from the government, then it is not efficient because if it's efficient, you'll be able to manage your own interest. There's very interesting work done on the case of uh, Japan a few years ago, uh, where they found that where the sub subsidies have gone to the inefficient, but clearly, when they saw some large subsidies being paid, um, then they, they discovered that these subsidies are paid to uh, to industries that are inefficient. So by uh, maintaining these emission, inefficient industries, most of the time they are not maintained, right? The ones that to happen to be maintained is a tax on the people. So they, mm -hmm. they, they the ability to, to create, start import substitution when there is a barrier there. So if a, efficient in, import substitution, where even with a barrier, then the, they can, um, compete with the other, other, the other, other imports. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Adi. Yeah. Um, uh, Professor Atakorel, I see that you would like to uh, weigh in here. If you would, yeah. would be able I mean, to keep your comments brief, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. I, I want to make two points. It seems that we are not very well focused on the real issues. I, now, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Chabi made a very important point, uh, which directly related to our uh, develop, uh, export development policy. He made the point that uh, Vietnam export un, uh, uh, under uh, GSP plus had increased by a uh, few hundred times. Uh, Bangladesh export had increased by about 100 or 150 times, but Sri Lankan export had increased only by 60. Awesome. I think this point is very important uh, when we discuss about supply side issues relating to Sri Lankan uh, export development strategy. Now, this point directly relates to uh, the FTA debate. The purpose of GSP plus, of course, uh, EU has been uh, generous and given us GSP plus, that the demand side measure. Again, we are talking about sign-in FTAs. Uh, now government has uh, appointed a new minister to sign as many as possible uh, FTAs. Mm -hmm. What's the point of sign-in FTAs to open up markets, right? Therefore, the real issue is whether our export expansion is constrained by supply side issues or demand side issues. Actually, it is so tempting to show you a figure related to this. I think this issue is central to the overall debate. I think it's good if you can spend a few minutes to discuss about this uh, fi uh, figure. Yeah. yeah uh, let me make it make a dynamic call. Can you see? It? Yeah, yes, Professor, see it. we but can very, see very it. Clear. Now, say so what does this figure shows is total export from developing countries has 
20, uh, as a share of world trade has increased dramatically during that period. It yeah. is on the right uh, right hand scale, right? Yeah. Now, say, look at what has happened. Sri Lanka's world market share. Sri Lankan world market share has plummeted from about 2000 throughout this period. What does this shows is that it is not opening more market what is important for Sri Lanka, but addressing the supply side issues, right? The uh, anti-export bias. This is a big issue. Now the government is promote introducing import restriction, uh, trying to intervene in the for uh, HN rate determination. All these have resulted in shifting the incentive structure against export production. And uh, uh, it's becoming more and more profitable to sell in the domestic market. At the same time, FDI is not coming to Sri Lanka because of the adverse investment climate. According to my calculations, between 2005 and 2009, 230 export-oriented firms left Sri Lanka, mainly because of uh, the policy regime was not favorable for attracting foreign direct investment to the country. Uh, that's a close relationship between export-oriented foreign direct investment and export expansion. And all these factors have led to a dramatic decline in Sri Lanka's share in world trade in a context where the country's export shares in the world trade had increased dramatically. What does this show? Uh, and again, what uh, uh, Mr. Dennis Chai data shows is that existing market opportunities are not exploited by our exporters. I think we need to focus on this issue. Now, th uh, that one point I want to make. The second point uh, I want to make relating to the point uh, uh, Dr. Rajapath mentioned about uh, import substitution and export orientation. Now, according to Central Bank report, the government believe that both can be done uh, side by side. On the one hand, you promote exports. On the other hand, you intervene in the domestic market to promote import substitution industrialization. Relating to this policy, we learn that should learn lesson from the 1970s. This is exactly what the United Front government did. And uh, Dr. N. M. Perera, the theorist behind the economic policy, he did not ignore outward orientation. He said in budget speech, we want to become globally integrated, but in our own way. We want to protect our industries and then provide the setting to become uh, export oriented, right? He was a Trotskyist. Trotskyists believed in global integration, but they did not realize understood the confusion, conflict between uh, nationalistic ideas and export orientation. Even the words in some of the documents recent in Sri Lanka have been borrowed from the reports done during that period, 1970s, right? What, what happened during that period? Uh, there were a lot of export incentives. We had a system called FEEDS, Foreign Exchange Entitlement certificate scheme giving 65% uh, additional uh, foreign exchange incentive for exporters. Then NMPERA came, came up with the Foreign Direct Investment Promotion Act, 2000, uh, nine, uh, 1972. It, he gave a lot of incentive uh, to foreign investors. At the same time, he created the GEM Corporation and all these things. But what happened? There was no export expansion during that period, simply because of the draconian import restriction regime 
incentive structure had uh, skewed towards domestic market oriented production. Uh, during that, uh, relating to this period, I did a study about firm level export expansion during that period. Uh, I'm happy to say I did it with Professor W.D. Lakshman. Do you know one of the main findings uh, of firm level uh, evidence is that the two biggest exporters, manufactured exporters at that time, who are they? Can you guess? Liver Brothers and Ceylon Tobacco Company. Simply because in order to get export import entitlement, they were diverting some of their production through their branch network to other countries, right? It created bogus export during that period, right? Therefore, we are heading towards that regime. If you try to promote export on the one hand and promote import substitution on the other hand, eventually the incentive structure get distorted. Even the little export you might get can be bogus export. I think this is a dead end strategy. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it is true that in Taiwan and Korea, they promote, promoted certain industries, but on a definite time bound way, at the same time, they maintain in incentives for export production in line with the protectionist regime. If you can do that, then it will uh, be fine. But in this fragile democracy, where protectionist lobby, say Vietnam, is dominated by protectionists, right? They are the ones who advocate policies. In that context, I think trying to promote export orientation with import substitution, I think it's a nightmare. It's not going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Atikor. Uh, Dr. Raj Patrana, did you want to uh, comment that? No. Yeah. No. Sorry. Go. Um, Dr. Raj Patrana, you're muted. If you could unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank so you. this whole idea of export promotion by having one group of people who have very little connection uh, to act, people who actually do exports. Uh, I'm making various forecasts, we'll increase it by 20%, 30%. Utterly backward situation and also commodity by commodity. Uh, that's the first thing. My second point is this, that the interesting thing that we found in East Asia is this. Not only did the government did, uh, do what uh, Professor Atugaral has mentioned, uh, it's time bound support, but in most cases later, they allow the private sector to make their decisions and get into area. Then in the Korea, they help them once the, the decision where to invest and what to do was made by the private sector individual, individuals, by the industrialists. So that's quite a different story from when the government gets involved in making these choices. I am always very skeptical that public servants, uh, uh, people who can make that type of judgment, uh, they should not be in it at all. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Raj Patrana. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, if I could direct uh, the next question to you. Uh, it's quite clear now from, the, from what we've heard from both yourself and from the other panelists uh, that Sri Lanka hasn't quite taken full advantage of the GSP plus uh, concession that and, and benefit that has been given to the country. Um, in your opinion, what is it that we can do to a take full advantage of this while we have it? And and then also from the perspective of the EU, that is uh, 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 that is as a as an entity, a large trading body. Uh, what is the do you kind of what are your comments on, on, on the direction that trade policy should be taking, uh, drawing from what our panelists have been discussing as well? Um, that's not an easy question for uh, an outsider to answer. And I think that uh, 
uh, all uh, the professors and doctors uh, who are uh, the current panelists have uh, spoken at length on, on what could be done. As a practitioner, um, uh, so as, as someone who is perhaps uh, more aware of the constraints of politics uh, on the decisions to take, um, I would say two things. The first one is obviously the EU, and the best way to talk about an, uh, uh, this kind of policy is, is to, to, to root it in empirical uh, knowledge of the EU. The, the, the different uh, uh, proposals made uh, uh, by Professor Corolla Rajapatirana, Dr. Silva, um, has worked really well for the EU. You know, the EU after the Second World War uh, was pretty much uh, uh, in the doldrums. Um, and the opening of trade has, uh, has benefited, I mean, globalization has benefited uh, dramatically countries like Ch China, India, but has also benefited to the EU. Uh, but one of the big issue um, in the EU is to be able for the social system to redistribute the benefit of globalization to every citizen. And that's something really uh, of a domestic policy. Now, um, to move from quite a closed economy, uh, you know, import restrictions, uh, issue of uh, balance of payment, uh, um, a lot of red tape and things to a totally open uh, economy cannot happen overnight. And if it happened overnight, you know, there would be troubles, riots, uh, and shocks. Um, but it's really for the, for the government to assess. What is clear is that there are some uh, uh, lower hanging fruits, I think, in, in terms of dynamizing the, the trade. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Rajapatirana said, productivity is essential, but productivity um, has to be articulated around uh, the things that can slow down productivity. And I'm here I'm talking about the stability of the legislative framework, uh, the reliability of the measures, uh, the administrative capacity, so how the administration performs, uh, how it uh, uh, implements the rule, um, the capacity to move um, quickly, uh, the logistics, the, the ports, the, the roads. So there are lots of elements that are low hanging fruits where um, perhaps the state by, by listening more to its entrepreneur, to its business communities, could improve the productivity and the competitiveness. Um, I think it's for the business communities to make their voice heard and explain which are these low hanging fruits things. And, and I think that this would pave the way for the measures that have been uh, advocated by uh, the prestigious uh, speakers, which is more trade openness by uh, uh, certainly doing away with uh, import restrictions uh, lowering uh, tariffs and especially para tariffs, which are uh, hidden and, and are really a hindrance on competitiveness. Um, but I think that it has to be uh, a progressive way with a, a clear plan, with uh, a start, a middle, an end that are thought through. Immediate measures that are implemented overnight uh, disrupt uh, economic life and therefore deters uh, investors, would be investors, entrepreneurs. So, um, it's not, it's, it, I'm not offering a, a lot of uh, concrete uh, uh, examples, but I'm trying to root what the previous speakers have said into a, a concrete experience. Start with clear, low hanging fruits in terms of productivity, uh, administrative capacity, legislative framework, and then move with some ambitions on making the uh, economy truly more open. But it has to be progressive and it has to be also with due consideration to the monetary situation because one cannot uh, have the trade policy in isolation uh, from uh, uh, the overall economic situation. And there, the monetary uh, uh, situation has to be addressed at the same time or even prior to the uh, trade opening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, actually, if I could, uh, Dr. Dairat Silva, if you could also uh jump in on that we've had a question uh that's very much in line with what the ambassador also just spoke on uh concern that okay if we abolish protectionism um we will gain new jobs but we some people would also lose their jobs and how do you address that uh address the the reality that some people are going to lose out um at least initially uh, when you start, even if you do a gradual uh, progression from uh, from protectionism to uh, an open economy, uh, would you be able to to 
to give us your, your thoughts on that. Thank you, Anita. Yes. You know, this is the, um, this is the natural tendency. If you move away from the protection, the free trade at the beginning, at the very beginning, uh, uh, there are costs, right? These costs could be in terms of job losses or a certain adjustment. Um, with that, what will happen? These are very short term. In the long, in the long run, right? Long term benefits outweigh the short term cost. So we we know that it has happened in the East Asian countries, right? Now, socialist country like uh, Vietnam, right? I, I was in Geneva when this uh, Geneva, you know, the, they tried to, what do you call this, uh, get in the WTO membership, 2007, right? Um, I, 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 I had the time to engage with these negotiators, how painful that would be, right? Right? But uh, Vietnam was in a kind of a liberalization footpath, you know, they, that, that happened, but in the uh, short term, until 2012, they had, uh, you know, some pain, but in the long run, now, I mean, 2007, when they acceded to the WTO, it took about 10 years to get into the WTO, 1995, they submit the application, to th that time the exports earning were hardly 6 billion. US and 2007 about um, 50 billion. Now they are gone to uh, 280 billion. So you must have a, what I say is a long term vision for your trade policy, right? Without a long term policy, uh, but uh, we, you know that won't work. So there are cost gain, but long term benefits outweigh the short term losses. This is. My um, on the DSP plus, if you have, you know what is the main problem is, you know the Sri Lanka, um, you know the the it is again the supply side the capacity constraint. Sixty six percent of the you know the ta EU tariff lines, you know you know it's a unilateral concession, right? Sri Lanka enjoy uh, due to the access, right? We lost the GSP plus 2001. Had we continued that, you know, you know, the lost years, seven years, we would have been in a better, better position. The unfortunately, but also there is the issue of these rules of origin, rules of origin. Now, Bangladesh was mentioned. Bangladesh, of course, mainly uh, I have mentioned in the recent GSP plus seminar, is a, is a, what they are uh, required to fulfill is the what do you call the single transformation. Uh, of rules of origin, about Sri Lanka country, country like a double tongue, which is very stringent, right? And the utilization of the GSP plus is recorded as the lowest in the apparel industry. It is not something to do with the awareness. Apparel sector is the most vibrant. They know what the concession, where, where the preferential access are. It's the rules of origin. Yeah. Well, that's a brief reflection. Yeah, why well, you want to say something? Let's start Rajpatrana. Can I? Yeah. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Dr. Rajpatrana. Yeah, you know, um, reforms delayed also means benefits are delayed. So when Sri Lanka liberalized in 1977, it was done without, there was some preparation. I know that preparation was there. But, you know, if you have a plan and if you tell the public, the Age and economic agents. Your program of first is to get rid of uh, uh, that tariff. The next thing, next stage is to go stages by reducing. Gives them fair warning to people who will operate in an open economy. Okay, people are waiting for the opportunity. So it is true that we cannot do it all of a sudden. They have some preparation in 1977, and what happened? It worked very well till uh, some some. Why our liberalization did not fully take, give all the benefits is that because at the same time we started Mahavali. <coughs> so, excuse me. 
So Mahaveli became a real uh, thing that changed the incentives, created what uh, later Professor Gordon and them called the Dutch disease problem arose because of the inflow of capital from Mahaveli. So while we were trying to improve our tradable sectors with the proper exchange rate policy and all that, on the other hand, the imports of a large amount of foreign exchange led to uh, uh, going in the opposite direction. So I'm for, uh, I'm not saying you can do it in very short time, but we, it can be done within reasonable time so that the markets learn that the new opportunities are going to arise in the system. Thank you, Dr. Ajpatrana. I think Professor Atukorala wants to weigh in on this. Yeah, because this is a very important issue. I think somebody had asked whether when tariff is reduced, there can be employment losses, right? And then the, that is a, a electorate always ask that issue. Therefore, I think we have to be very careful on this. Now, we need to give examples from our own past to highlight this point. Actually, when I first wrote my first article about Sri Lankan liberalization, I was basically very lamenting about employment losses. Uh, you can have a look at it uh, in Upanati. First issue, I wrote an article about uh, uh, 50,000 girls uh, losing jobs in handloom factories, right? And uh, look at what happened. The ready-made garment industry is <coughs> creating more than half a million jobs. Initial loss, <coughs> we exaggerated. <coughs> but uh, eventually, it paid off. Apparel industry <coughs> becoming the biggest employment generator in the country. Now, <coughs> according to data I have analyzed, manufacturing employment in 1975, that was the height of the state-led import substitution uh, industrialization was uh, 404,000, right? Now, manufacturing employment is more than 1.5 million. Uh, as Dr. Rajar Bhattana said, there were problems with li uh, liberalization, but liberalization worked to make the manufacturing sector a major employment generator. And again, look at the type of jobs. Most of the jobs created in the uh, government-owned factories were very expensive. According to, again, I calculate this data from a study compiled by Professor Laxman and the team, 51,000 rupees per one job. If you convert it into current prices, it would be about 3.5 million jobs. The creating one job in protectionist industries was very expensive. But uh, in labor intensive manufacturing, so many jobs were created, but at a low cost. Uh, this is the uh, message we should give to the voters about liberalization. Now, relating to that, when we talk about liberalization, we are not talking about reducing uh, trade barriers only. As Dr. Rajapatanda said, it has to be a package import liberalization has to be combined by, with a realistic exchange rate policy uh, in order to maintain export competitiveness. What had happened in Sri Lanka is that economy was open, but exchange rate continued to appreciate. The real exchange rate index in 2019 is only about 1 16th of the real exchange rate index in 1978. Right? We liberalized, but we did not stabilize the country. And the real exchange rate appreciated. Even with all these problems, why export-led uh, industrialization performed better in employment generation, uh, one should not forget this fact. Unlike in many other countries, our trade liberalization was 
combined with foreign investment liberalization, they went hand in hand, trade reform and FDI reform. Because of the FDI reform, foreign investors came. Martin Trust came to Sri Lanka as a foreign buyer, and he created two giant export powerhouses, Brandix and uh, Mars, right? This thing happened mainly because of the investment liberalization. If you want, you can talk to Mahesh Shamalin or Ashraf Puma. They will tell the story. We liberalize, we liberalize foreign investment regime together. It helped us to achieve a lot. But imagine without going into Mahavali, telescoping it to six years, maintain uh, macroeconomic stability, we would have even avoided the civil war. I mean, I read this beautiful story in uh, Lee Kuan Yew biography. When Sri Lanka, uh, UNP won the election, they introduced liberalization reform. He was very happy because uh, Lee Kuan Yew has a big relationship with, with uh, Sri Lanka because his father worked for a Sri Lankan jeweler. In, uh, therefore, when the country was liberalized, he was happy. He gave half a day interview for uh, President Jayawardhan, right? Then in the uh, discussion, in the book, he says, uh, President came and talked about uh, opening free trade zone, uh, land area size, Singapore and everything. And uh, I was very happy. Then he said, President started talking about national airline. Then he asked the question, President, at this stage, should that be the priority? We develop an airport much later. You need to provide the in infrastructure and maintain the incentive structure to promote export. Now, this is where the reformist party did not understand the point. I mean, the UMP did a fine job in opening the economy. Actually, the opening the economy was done not because of uh, World Bank advice, but because of policy recommendation made by an important Indian economist. Uh, uh, we are, uh, what is it? Um, yeah, I, I have forgotten it. I mean, a lot of people who criticize World Bank don't know this story. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are Shinoi, yeah. his report, which is in, uh, they are library, both the policy blueprint for JR reform. Actually, he advocated trade liberalization with macroeconomic stabilization. Uh, government liberalized, but did not stabilize. That was the problem. Then now people blame the World Bank and IMF. Uh, World Bank, if you read World Bank report, Sarat uh, knows all this. World Bank objected to this massive investment uh, uh, package at that time. But the government uh, said, no, we are going to get foreign aid. Therefore, we are going to implement it. And by doing that, incentive structure was distorted. Then the point I'm going to make is that liberalization would have done wonders in Sri Lanka if it were combined with macroeconomic reforms like uh, B.R. Shinoi advocated, right? But we did not do it. Yeah, that is the big lesson. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Atikorala. I think we are now uh, very close to running out of time, but we have a few more questions that have come in from the audience. Um, if I could ask uh, that uh, the panelists keep their responses as brief as possible. Um, Dr. Raj Patrin, if I could ask you, uh, one of the questions that have come in is uh, uh, very rooted in, 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 a, in the economic situation right now in Sri Lanka. Uh, what's the solution in a pandemic when a country is short of foreign exchange as open trade would lead to not having reserves to pay for uncontrolled imports uh, is the question that was sent in. Uh, would you be able to, to tackle that for us? The clever answer to say, try not to get into it. But actually, if we are, we are there, they, there, are other, there are a number of ways to do it. Uh, first of all, I would say, in the past when we were, such a, we were in such a situation, we went to the IMF. 
for some reason we don't want to go there anymore. They rescued us 16 times in such situations. And now with huge amount of debt, which we did not have before, we have not prepared to go. Now the IMF is important not because of the money they give, much more importantly, the discipline it will put into our system. So if, for example, if we have a program, shall we say we have a program exactly like the IMF, that is uh, cutting, demand, cutting demand down, uh, removing barriers to supply, uh, uh, supply expansion, uh, have a, a exchange rate that is uh, 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 competitive exchange rate, then we can go some other way. And also we can convince our debtors and our would-be debtors that we, we will be disciplined and we will do uh, a good job uh, in uh, uh, as, a, as a person, as a country that can repay its debt and which we have done so far, thanks to the IMF. So now some people say uh, IMF, uh, uh, programs are failed. <laughs> Actually, it's not the IMF program that we, we fail. We never met the IMF uh, uh, criteria that was set for us in terms of domestic asset expansion and those things. So I would say we are in a very tight situation. In this situation, all economists that of my ilk of that I know would say go to the IMF because they had to pay a larger premium price if we didn't in the sense that then we'll have to cut down uh, imports even farther. We, we are, our, then the government's other policies uh, also won't help, like banning this, that, and the other. Uh, and so I would say we are in a difficult position, but it's not an impossible position. We can, if you can get uh, IMF support, you can do it. The thing is that, uh, it is the low, least cost or un, low cost way of doing it. I won't say least, low cost way of doing it. Uh, if you are not able to do it, then we have to pay a very high cost in terms of not having funds, not only having the disability, not having funds. Uh, then we have to introduce various other controls from which we can't get out easily. That's the point. If you move away from taking advantage of the our location, our position to be a participating in world trade, then our chances are all reduced. Uh, what we can go from bad to worse in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So um, so that is my go to the IMF, have a program, uh, uh, get, get your uh, people together to develop a good team who can handle this, uh, who, who has experience having done this, and can be done. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it is so tempting to add one point to Dr. Rajapath, what Dr. Rajapatham said. I agree with everything. And I want to give an example. Dr. N. M. Perra, even though his economic policies we criticize, he was a very intelligent I mean, statement, right? Uh, in his budget speech in uh, 1970, I have this quotation, I don't have time. He clearly said that small open economy like Sri Lanka cannot ignore international organization. He went to IMF in 1964 as part of the coalition government, but he failed getting loans. I have even got his speech, right? He could not get it because at that time, uh, because of politics, they, they could not uh, come up with a sensible package to reduce government expenditure. Therefore, they could. Then he went to IMF in 1970. At that time, Central Bank has a, had a visionary governor, Herbert Tendakong, Treasury Bosso's Rajendran, world-class technocrats. These two helped Dr. N. M. Perra to come up with the proposal and the IMF was convinced. They, they convinced the IMF saying that uh, we will continue with our state-led industry life. At that time, actually, it was accepted by IMF, right? Import substitution and other things. But they came up with a clear plan to reduce the budget speed, uh, deficit. Therefore, they got a loan. 
Then what happened was in 2004, and then prepared another proposal. I mean, if you want, I can give you the document. Don't ask how I got all this. Uh, then what happened was by the time he was negotiating them, uh, he was, I think, lost his uh, cabinet post or something. It did not happen. Then the point I made is that if a real statement, I think he had to do, uh, he, he had deal it from LSE, right? He was a bright politician. He understood the importance of IMF, but people who run this country now, I think they don't know this history. Yeah, that's the point I want to Thank add you. Here. Thank uh, you. Dr. Silva, if you would like to uh, comment on that, on the on on uh, uh, if you would like to comment on on uh, the points raised by Dr. Raj Patrana and uh, Professor Atukorala. Yeah, you're muted, sir. Um, unless you are. Okay, that's. Well, well I, I, uh, uh, I, could, I totally agree with what uh, Professor Atukorla said. Um, well, I also don't understand. Uh, are we waiting until the voter goes about the nose? to go to the seek support i mean uh, resolve this the current crisis so it's totally uh, agree but there are a few questions that has been raised here in the anyway you can sure. you want to ask oh i do you want me to reflect on this um is there something in particular you want to address sir if you can address it briefly because we are running out of time questions here asking one is asking, is there any possibility that uh, Sri Lanka face a WTO uh, sort of a dispute panel because of the Q quantitative restriction? Sure, sir. If you would like to tackle just that question, since we are running out of time, uh, if you would like to tackle that. There is one question. Yes, indeed. You know, now, um, you know, quantitative restriction, as I said, to answer the questions are prohibited, but there are exceptions. There are two exceptions under because the non-economic reason than the economic reason. Economic reasons are uh, there are five, one mainly the BOP, you know, the uh, BOP reason, right? But I recall in 1998, uh, Sri Lanka uh, disrevoked uh, employing this uh, uh, balance of payment, uh, you know, difficulty. But WTO members are very sensible. They sensitive to the, this COVID situation. But the only question is, see, and, and you know, this, even you are applying the BOP provisions, right? Um, you need to follow the procedures. First and foremost, you have to notify to the WTO, right? And then you must, in, in notifying, uh, you have to set a timetable. Okay, but how they are going to kind of remove them, and then engage in the consultation. I doubt, I doubt whether these procedures have been followed. Um, if not, well, we are in a club, you know, we have participated in negotiation. It is possible that to happen. Finally, you know, one question is this uh, very quickly, why, you know, you know, actually that country some, you know, the later uh, have progressed very well, this is true. Cambodia LDC to, in 2004, they exceeded. They have progressed well because they, and Vietnam also. These countries uh, have progressed well because they were forced to undertake and Vietnam was forced to bind their 100% tariff and bind them at 35%, uh, you know. So it's uh, uh, the reform agenda that has, uh, they have undertaken as part of the WTO commitment resulted partly uh, in progressing um, well in the export front and the domestically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Silva. Uh, Professor Atukorala, if I could direct one last question to you uh, that has come from the audience. Uh, there is a lot of uh, debate and also a bit of confusion on the topic of industrial policy and whether it is a, 
what it is, in fact, I think that is something that needs to be clarified. And then what, what, what is it a solution for Sri Lanka? Um, and if you could very briefly comment on that, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, okay, I think maybe Professor Atukorale is facing some technical challenges. Um, I think we have now run uh, quite over time. Um, I would like to call uh, call on the ambassador, uh, H.C. Dennis Chaibi, if he would like to make uh, any final comments. No, I just uh, would like to thank you and all the participants to this debate. I think. Uh, it was lively and um, allowed for a, a good exchange. And uh, uh, we, we will work now uh, very much on the monitoring of the GSP plus and then continue the conversation with the government about the import restrictions, uh, which are a concern for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so today's event has been live streamed uh, on the following pages. It's been available on the morning, the morning business, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, NewsHub.lk English, Economy Next, Echelon, BusinessNews.lk, Citizen.lk, other economy and business and economy and business Sri Lanka. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists for giving their time today, uh, quite a bit of their time, I must say, um, and for contributing to what was a very interesting and uh, engaging discussion on a topic that is very much current and of the utmost importance to Sri Lanka at this point. Um, I would also like to thank our interpreters who made it possible for this event to be accessible in all three languages on Zoom. Uh, thank you very much, that is much appreciated. Um, if you're interested in learning more on this topic, uh, the primer by Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana on international trade from theory to policy, Sri Lanka in perspective, uh, can be found on our Facebook, our YouTube and all our social media. Um, do take some time to uh, check this out. And while you are there, please follow us on our social media platforms. There will be a screen appearing uh, on, uh, there will be a slide appearing on your screens in a minute. Uh, and stay updated on our events, on our publications, and of course, uh, our policy analysis on what is happening in Sri Lanka's economy. Um, I'd like to thank our audience today. Um, I hope everyone will stay safe and good night. <laughs>